Song leaders, what's all the books up here? No, I'm just kidding. It's okay. It's not just my pulpit. It's our pulpit, right? I was thinking, uh, thank you for the opening, Jonathan. Um, back in the day, when I used to do openings, I, uh, I got a little long myself from time to time. I remember, <clears throat> I remember being at a, at a brotherhood meeting, and um, one of the, the brothers at the meeting made it known that he, he didn't come to church to hear two sermons. And uh, he didn't mention any names, but we all knew who he was talking about. And, um, but you know, I, I've always felt, and I still feel to this day, that if the Lord has laid something on your heart that the body of Christ needs to hear, then you share it. And if that means that the opening goes a little bit longer, which means that the message goes a little bit longer, praise God. I mean, churches in China are having four or five hour church services and we're like, well, I got to get to BPs by one. Come on. We're not like that. I'm glad we're not like that. Now, I mean, on the other hand, I don't want to waste your time. Your time is valuable, and we want to honor and respect that. But we are here to hear what the Lord has for the church in Slave Lake. So if he's put something on your heart, and that's for all of you that are doing the openings. Don't feel like you got to just get up and get down. This pulpit is our pulpit. It is for the word of God to go forth. And so that's what we are here to do this morning. My message is titled, Certain Uncertainty. A little play on words there. Have some fun with that. Think about that for a little bit. And it will be found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So if you have your Bibles, let's turn to 1 Corinthians 15. And I want to read from verse 51 down through 58. And if you will please rise for the reading of God's holy word. First Corinthians 15, starting in verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass that the saying that was written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Heavenly Father, again, we, we come before you this morning and we thank you for the preservation of your word. God, we thank you that we have your words written for us. Lord, that you used holy men by the power of your spirit to pen things that you wanted us to hear and you have preserved them these thousands of years. And so, Father, we just pray that this morning as we, as we look at these words and as we meditate on these words and as we hear these words, Father, I pray that your word would penetrate into our hearts, God, that we would have an understanding of what you want us to understand here. Lord, that you may ultimately be glorified and that your church, the bride, would be purified and strengthened for your honor and glory. God, we thank you for all that you have done, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. When I preached the message on Easter Sunday, or rather, Resurrection Sunday, 
Um, this 1 Corinthians 15, 58 was my closing verse. And after that, I was thinking, as I, as I you know, reading again and looking at it, I thought, man, that's, there's a message in that verse. There's so much in that verse. And, and so I, I wanted to share a little bit about that this morning. We live in an age of certain uncertainty. In other words, the only thing that you are allowed to be certain about is that you're not certain about anything. The only absolute that this world offers is that there are no absolutes. So if somebody ever tells you that there are no absolutes, you can always ask them, are you absolutely sure? If you ever make a statement of certainty, of surety, you, you make a confident statement, you will immediately be challenged by, well, that's just your opinion. And it's usually said in a condescending way as well, too. That's just your opinion. And in terms of the Bible, it's very often the same. Make any statement of certainty about what the Word of God says, and you will immediately be challenged by the phrase, well, that's just your interpretation. And I must admit, there are things that are open to interpretation. There are things that are, as Peter said, hard to be understood. There are certain positions that you can't necessarily take dogmatically because it's complicated. Oh, one of the things that I often think about is end times. Do you know how many views there are on the end times? And just when you think you have a certainty, you go, okay, I figured this out now. All of a sudden you read another verse and you're like, wait, wait, that doesn't fit. And so all of these people have different views. But realistically, if we simplify the end times, our end times theology, here's what we do know. Jesus is coming back. He is going to set things right. And he wins. That, that we do know. When, how, and what, you, okay, now we're, we're getting into the, the areas where we can argue. And there's nothing wrong with having those discussions. So there are certain things that are difficult to understand. There are certain things that we can't necessarily just plant a flag and say, this is the way it is. You know, if I was in a Baptist church, I wouldn't be allowed to preach. Because I don't have a tie on. Certain Baptist churches, not all, obviously. But you ask them, okay, wait, wait, where is that said in Scripture? Well, it's not, but that's the way we interpret the Scripture, right? So these things are open for debate. The way we ought to conduct ourselves. But when it comes to the gospel, when it comes to the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ, there is no room for error. There is no room for compromise. There's no room for saying, well, maybe we can have a different interpretation. No. When Jude exhorted the brethren of his day to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints, that was a command for all time. And so we, as a church, we must also earnestly contend for the faith. There are things that we can be certain about. We don't have to be uncertain. We don't have to waver. And that's what brings us to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. He starts with the word, therefore. And we always love this word, therefore. Now, there are three rules of Bible interpretation that I, I like to follow. There's probably more, but these are three basic ones, and I want you to kind of take these and, and, and use them yourselves. The first one is to never read a Bible verse. I don't know, I'm already getting some strange faces from the crowd. Wait, what? Never read a Bible verse? No, never read a Bible verse by itself. A lot of bad doctrine comes from reading 
Bible verses by themselves. Yesterday, someone mentioned uh, Bible memory, and, and the person said that, he's like, if you have difficulty memorizing things, maybe just memorize one verse. And I remember I was, th- I was sitting there, I'm thinking like, no, don't do that. Not just one. And I know if I discussed it with him, he would understand what I meant. Because if you look at your Bibles, you'll notice that some of these verses aren't even in a complete sentence. Some of these verses, if you take them by themselves, actually don't even make sense. But people do this. They'll take a Bible verse, isolate it from the verses around it, and they'll say, this is what the Bible says. That doesn't make a lot of sense. So never read a Bible verse, which brings us to the second rule, which is context, context, context. Usually if you have trouble understanding a Bible verse, if you read the surrounding context, you will get an understanding of what he's actually talking about. Read the chapter, read the book, read the book in the context of when it was written and why it was written and to whom it was written. And that, of course, leads to the third rule, if you want to understand context. If you see a therefore, you have to ask the question, what is the therefore therefore, right? Therefore is a concluding statement, but it's at the beginning of the verse. So if you start your verse, if you wanted to memorize this this verse, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, you're already missing part of it. You're missing his message. It's a great verse, and I want to preach on this verse, but this verse by itself is, he starts with a therefore, which is concluding his statement. So what's the therefore, therefore? Well, if you look at chapter 15, he starts out and he exhorts the brethren, he exhorts them to remember the gospel. He says, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I have preached unto you, which you have received, and wherein ye stand. By which ye also are saved, if you keep in memory that which I have preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. He says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And then he talks about how he was seen, eyewitness accounts of the resurrected Christ. Everybody knew that Jesus was, in fact, risen from the dead because they saw him. Peter, John, all of the disciples, 500 brethren at one time. They all saw the risen Christ. Then he talks about this issue that they had in Corinth about some people were saying, actually, you know what, there is no resurrection. And Paul, of course, he says, well, if there is no resurrection, then Jesus isn't raised. And if Jesus isn't raised, you're still in your sins, and this is all for for nothing. He goes on to encourage the believers, as we read already here in verses 51 through 57, that, that death has been defeated, that we, as believers, because of the resurrection, no longer fear death. And after explaining all of those things, he comes to verse 58, this summary statement. And he says, therefore, beloved brethren, beloved brethren. And I had to stop when I, when I was reading this. He says, therefore, my beloved brethren. I know someone personally who, um, he has a gift He has the gift of discernment. And this is not one of the gifts that is really enjoyed in the body of Christ. If you have the gift of discernment, what that means is you you often see when there's a problem and nobody else sees it. You can see things where they're going to lead. Right? You understand trajectory and you understand that, okay, if you allow this, then this, this, and this, and this. So we need to be careful with this. And most people don't see the this, this, and this, and so they don't appreciate this, right? You don't appreciate it when somebody comes up to you and tells you the thing that you're doing is wrong, right? Especially if you you don't see it. 
And so this gift isn't very much appreciated. But the problem with this particular person's method of bringing across these things that he sees is there's no beloved brethren in his statements. Usually his statements are something akin to, if you don't believe what I believe, you're probably not saved anyway. God is not the author of confusion, and since I have the Holy Spirit, you clearly don't. Well, what happens after a while when somebody speaks that way? You turn them off. And the gift, which is actually valuable and needed in the church, goes unused because nobody's listening anymore. And I was thinking about the way Paul talks and the way he refers to the Corinthian church. He says, therefore, my beloved brethren. Okay, he is putting himself in this church. And what I find fascinating is when you think about, think about the book of 1 Corinthians. I don't know how many of you ever really studied the book of 1 Corinthians, but Paul has a lot of very pointed things to say to the Corinthian church. Paul is dealing with a lot of problems in the Corinthian church. Chapter 1, he's dealing with divisions. He hears this from the house of Chloe. Chapter 3, he's talking about a lack of growth. He says, you guys are still babes in Christ. He can't even speak to them because they're not, they're not growing. He says, some of you, you're, you're carnal. And he's upset with them. In chapter 4, he, he talks about pride and self-exaltation. Chapter 5, they're dealing with all sorts of sexual immorality. Chapter 6, he's dealing with lawsuits between brothers and sisters in Christ. They're taking each other to law, to, to the law. They're suing each other. In chapter 7, there's issues about divorce and remarriage and, and what you're supposed to do. In chapter 8, he's talking about things offered to idols. In chapter 9, he's dealing with questions about financially supporting the apostles and whether or not they should or, or how ministries should run. In chapter 10, he again has some more warnings about pride. Chapter 11, you're dealing with issues of headship and problems in the Lord's Supper. In chapter 12, the issue of spiritual gifts and abuses of those spiritual gifts comes up. In chapter 13, he has to lay out for them what love looks like. In chapter 14, he has some more exhortations on gifts and unity in how these gifts are used. So this church, we often talk about the Corinthian church. I feel, I feel bad for the Corinthian church because we kind of, that's like the one church we usually throw under the bus, the early church, right? Because they had a lot of issues. But in spite of all of these problems, in spite of all of these issues, Paul refers to them as beloved brethren. He's like, look, I've, I've told you guys a lot of stuff. I have, I have clarified a lot of things, and I have asked you to repent of many different things, but look, I love you. Paul wanted to make sure that these people knew they were beloved, even though his words sometimes were sharp and pointed. Even though sometimes the correction that he had to bring would have been very uncomfortable and maybe even humiliating for the people involved. He says, my beloved brethren, his heart is full of compassion and mercy and grace. And so as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about us. Myself, yourself, when we're dealing with the church, and when we are discussing issues within the church, I was thinking about this sign that David made. You know, some churches split over things like signs. I hate that sign. I can't believe you created that sign. And they get in all this big tussle. Or some churches, they get in big arguments about the color of the floor, right? What color rug you should have or what color chairs you have. Unfortunately for us, we've, we've always been one that works together very, very well. But I've thought about this, right? Like, if you vote for a certain sign, and we decide to go in a different direction, every time you drive up, you're going to be, I didn't like that sign, right? It's going to be in your mind. I didn't want that one. Why would everybody else want that one? They're crazy. But we are beloved brethren and sisters. Look. 
I voted for a sign. I'm not going to tell you which one. But David knows. But if we don't pick that sign, that's okay. Because you're more important to me than a sign. Your fellowship is more valuable to me than whatever we hang on the side of this building. And that's just a little thing. You know, we may have disagreements in church about how things should be done. We might have disagreements about whether or not certain people should be allowed to perform certain ministries or whether or not certain people should even be allowed to speak. That happens in churches. There's a church in Lacrete right now. I was told of not that long ago that if a certain speaker was going to come to preach in their church, they, many of the families weren't going to attend. That's a kind of a disappointing thought. My prayer is that we as a church, we would look at this sort of thing and we would say, beloved brethren, no matter the difficulty we're dealing with, no matter the struggle that we're dealing with, no matter the, the fight that we're fighting, we would never forget that we are family. We are beloved brethren and sisters, okay? It's just, it's, we're all one in Christ. Because of what Jesus has done for us individually, we now unite together as the body of Christ, or as our sign is going to say, the bride of Christ. And we will gather together to worship. And when we have these challenges, we will approach them as a family. We will deal with them as a family because we are beloved. And so he exhorts him, he says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable. I, uh, I often, I relate things to sports, and so I'm going to do that again. In hockey, I was not a great skater, so they made me a goalie. That's what you do with the kid that can't skate. You just throw him in the net. Um, and so I actually grew up to like it, and, uh, and so I've been, that's, that's what I've always done for the most part. But in order to be a good goalie, when, when the play is coming down the ice or when the guy is about to take the shot, you have to have your feet planted and set. You can't be moving. Anybody who's ever played goalie understands this. And so one of the most challenging things is, as a goalie, is when the, puck is, when the player is moving across and you have to try to follow him without moving too much so that you can't, don't have your feet set. I've been scored on many times, so I understand this. If your feet are moving when somebody shoots, you're in a bad place. You have to plant your feet, and you have to be ready. This is, I mean, this is true for most sports. We played volleyball last weekend, and if you're, sta if you're moving, if you're walking as you're playing volleyball, and the person serves the ball behind you, you're not in a good position. Right? What do you need to do when the person's about to serve the ball? Why does the person yell, service? Right? Why, why do they do that? Because you need to be ready. You need to plant your feet. You need to be prepared. You can't be moving. Stand firm. And that's what he's saying here. You need to be steadfast. A, a tactic of the devil is to keep you always wavering and always moving and never certain of anything to be certainly uncertain. That's what he wants in your life. And this uncertainty makes you less effective for the kingdom of God. Because if you're never sure about anything, how are you ever going to teach anybody else? If you're always uncertain and always wavering and always going from one thing to the next thing, you won't, even, you won't be able to teach anybody else. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, the apostle speaks of the importance of forgiveness, and he, he talks about how if you have unforgiveness, you're actually giving the devil an upper hand in your, in your life. But the apostle Paul says, no, no, we're not, we're, we are going to forgive because, he says, we are not ignorant of his devices. Paul said, we're not ignorant of the devil and the way he works. But I think sometimes we are. So one way that you can learn in the way that the enemy works is not so much about studying the devil. A lot of people love to study the devil. 
I don't understand why. Study Jesus. He defeated the devil. I mean, study the winning team. You understand how they work. Right? I don't know how many of you are following hockey at all. But if I wanted to study how to win a hockey game, I would look at what the Florida Panthers are doing, not the Montreal Canadiens. Montreal Canadiens actually broke a record this year. They're the first team to ever be to the Stanley Cup final and then finish dead last. Oof. My uncle's a Canadiens fan. I feel for him. But anyway, that's a little side note. The point is, is if you want to learn about something, learn about what God says. Don't worry about what the devil says. So one way that you can do that is you can study about what God says in his word about a certain situation. So what does God command? He says, be ye steadfast, unmovable. Well, what can we infer from that? That Satan wants you constantly moving. If God commands you to be steadfast, you can be sure that the devil wants you always moving. If God wants you to be confident, you can be sure that the devil wants you to be not confident. This word steadfast has an idea of being seated. You can think like a, a king on his throne. He is seated. He is sure. He is steadfast. He's not moving. The visual that I got in my head was, if you've ever been in Walmart and you see a two-year-old throw a tantrum because he wanted candy and he plops himself down on the floor because he's not going to move until he gets the candy, right? We've all, you've seen that kid, right? Not our kids, obviously, but those people out there, their kids, they do that. And I just had this image in my head of this, this child who, he is seated. He is steadfast in his resolve. Either I get candy or I stay here. Well, this is the attitude that we are to have when we are dealing with the truth of God's word. Not, not disobedient to our parents. That's not what I mean. But we need to be sure in our resolve. We need to be seated confidently that what we know is true. We need to be resolved, confident, and emphatic that this is truth, and we will not move. Now, for those of you who are here on Resurrection Sunday, why can we be so confident that Jesus is, in fact, risen from the dead? Because the tomb is empty. And because the tomb is empty and we have eyewitness accounts of the resurrected Christ, we can state emphatically, we can state without controversy that the resurrection of Christ is true, that the gospel is true, and if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. And we will offer this to everybody, and we will not move from our position. Let the attacks come. We're not moving. Let Oprah Winfrey say there's multiple ways to God. I don't care. Because God said there's one way, and that is Jesus Christ. Let the government say that it's illegal for you to preach that message. I don't care. This is the message we've been given to by God, and we will not move. We will be steadfast. Thank you. We cannot move from this position. We will not move from this position. We are that toddler. The government says you can't preach that anymore. Mm -hmm. Whether it is better to obey God or men rather than God, you decide. But we will only do that which we have seen and heard. We will only preach the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are steadfast. We are unmovable. <laughs> I, speaking of sports again. I was listening to a, a, a video the other day of a, of a guy, he, he, was, he was playing Division I football, which is like the highest level of college football that you could play in the U.S., and he was pretty full of himself. He was like 280 pounds of muscle, and he was, you know, came straight out of high school, and he was well-regarded, and he, was, he thought he was quite something. And his coach told him, he said, look, I need you to hit that guy when this happens, this play happens. He said, okay, I'm doing it. 
And he said, so the play happened, and he was about to tackle this guy, and all of a sudden, he got run over by somebody who was much bigger than he was. He was very movable. He thought he was all that, but it didn't take long. And he said, he looked up, and he said, I'd never seen a white guy that was that big in my entire life. And he said, I snapped my helmet, and I retired. I was done. (laughs) That was it. But we are unmovable. That big giant can come against us, and we are unmovable. But you see, it's not because we're strong. It's not because we have power. It's because of Christ. It is because of the rock who is beneath our feet. That rock is Jesus Christ. And if you want a life that is unmovable and unshakable, you obey your master, which is Christ. You obey him and you trust him and you lean on him and he will strengthen you. And then let the winds and waves do what they want. Your house won't fall because it is built on Christ. You know, this exhortation to stand firm, it's commonly repeated in Scripture. In fact, if you turn one page over in 1 Corinthians 16, you see this repeated again in in verse 13. He says, watch ye, stand fast in the faith. Quit ye like men, be strong. Stand fast, behave like men. I find it interesting. One of the ways that you know what God really highly esteems is by seeing what the world hates. And is there anything more hated in our modern world than a manly man? Than a man who acts like a man? Our world says men need to be effeminate. Be more like women. They're softer. They're gentler. No. Sorry. Not happening. The Bible says that I'm supposed to act like a man. And he even kind of clarifies as to what that looks like. Be strong. You know, I often, I tell my son, he's a little, he doesn't know it yet. But when I'm not there, he is the man of the house. And it's cute, he's seven, like really. But this is a reality that I want him to grow into. When we are at home and, and, and danger knocks on the door, who goes to the door? I do. Why? Because I'm the man. That's my job. I'm commanded to protect those in my care. I am commanded to be strong. Am I the strongest man? No. But I'm the strongest they got. <laughs> and I'm going to do what I've been commanded to do. And if I'm not there, who's next in line? It's not my oldest daughter. It's my oldest son. Because he is a man. And I'm going to raise him to be a man. By God's grace. That is the plan. I didn't mean to rhyme there. That was... That was... <laughs> Preacher rap. <clears throat> but we are told to stand fast. Which has this idea of unmovable. Right? You are not to be moved from your position. You stand fast. Think about it. Why are we told to put on the whole armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6? It says that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You stand planted. The devil comes at you with lies and he comes at you with temptation. And you plant your feet on the word of God and you are not moved. You're unwavering. You're unshakable. You are strong and you are confident, not in yourself, but in Christ. Not in your own truth, but the truth of God's word. And from that position of certainty, and from that position of confidence, then we go out and we abound in the work of the Lord. We are called to be about our Father's business. We have a Heavenly Father who has called us to labor in His vineyard. He says, I need you to go out and to make disciples of all nations. I need you to go out and care for those who need to be cared for. 
So this, this is what we call the work of the Lord. Now the work of the Lord starts with believing. Right? In, in John chapter 6, some people were following Jesus because they had just got a free lunch. Right? Jesus had fed the 5,000. And all of a sudden, wow, people were coming from everywhere. Well, wouldn't you follow a guy who can make bread from nothing? Well, he, he had bread, but he just multiplied it. You would literally never be hungry ever again. That's exciting. And so people started flocking and following Jesus. And yet he exhorts them in verse 27 of John chapter 6. He says, labor not for food that perishes, but for food that endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give you. For him hath God the Father sealed. Then they said unto him, what shall we do that we might do the works of God? Valid question. I want to do the works of God. What should I do? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he hath sent. Wow, that just takes all the power out of my hands, doesn't it? You're telling me that I can't do anything? No, you can't. You cannot earn favor with God. Why was Abraham called righteous? Because he believed God. And it was counted unto him for righteousness. However, this faith, this belief, this trusting in God equals something. If I believe in a red light, it is going to change my behavior. If I believe that that red light is what it says it is, I'm going to stop every time I see it. It affects the way I live. I can't just say I believe in red lights and blast through them. Or stop signs. You will get a $400 ticket in the mail if you forget the stop signs. So we are to be abounding in the work of the Lord. We obey this Jesus who we love. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you believe in Jesus and you love Jesus, therefore go and do It equals something. And this isn't just the ten. This, I mean, a quick glance at Scripture, and you will learn that there are actually a lot of things for you to obey as a believer. There are a lot of works that you are to be doing. This is just a quick summary. I have Scripture for all of these, but I'm not going to mention it just so that we can go a little bit faster. Husbands, you are to love and cherish your wives. Wives, you are to reverence and to submit to your husbands. Children, you are to obey your parents. We are to support the orphans and the widows. We are to love our enemies. We are to bless them that persecute us. We are to return evil or good for evil. Don't get that one mixed up. We, as much as we are able, we are to live peaceably with all men. We are to honor the king, to submit to government. We are to obey our boss. We are to be a good employee. We are to be a good and fair employer. We are not to sue brothers and sisters in Christ. We are to abstain from all forms of sexual immorality. We are not to speak with a loose tongue. We are not to gossip. We are not to slander. Slander. We are not to share crude humor. We are to resist the devil. We are to humble ourselves and draw close to God. We are to go into all the world and preach the gospel, teaching others to obey what the Lord has commanded. There's a lot more. But this is just a short list. We are to labor for our Lord. But here's the exciting part. It's not in vain. It's not in vain. That's, that is so exciting. So if you spend your life serving Jesus and loving Jesus and loving others and pouring yourself out for other people, it's not in vain. Imagine... Man, I've used a lot of sports today. Imagine being an Olympic athlete and you train for the 100-meter hurdles. I think it's actually 110 meters because of the hurdles. But So you imagine, how many of you have seen, watched people run the hurdles, right? They run, they jump, they run, they jump, they run, they jump. There's these hurdles. 
So imagine you've spent the last four years of your life, your training, what you eat, uh, everything, how much sleep you get, everything is, there's one goal, and that's to run this race. Finally, the day arrives, and you're the favorite to win. Everybody's watching you. You're going to go, and you're going to win this race. And you take out of the starting gate, and you run as fast as you can, and you hit that first hurdle, and you fall. You could effectively say that the last four years of your life were completely in vain. You had one goal in mind, and that was to win the medal. You're not winning the medal. Four years wasted. Training wasted. It was all for nothing. And this is kind of what we see in the world. We want to see that gold medal. We want to see that thing which we have worked so hard for. And this is what makes Christianity a little bit different because we operate by faith. We operate in a different realm. And in our realm, our labor that we put forward, the effort that we expend may not actually give us results that we can see. And that can be discouraging, right? I mean, if you've, if you've been praying for somebody for years and for years and for years, and you're praying for this person, and they're not coming to Christ, they're not changing, you don't seem to see any fruit in their life, it can be discouraging, but listen to what the Word of God says. He says your labor is not in vain. That means that if you don't see it in the here and now, there is coming a day when you will. There is coming a day when God will pour open His riches for you and He will show you and He will give to you the fruit of your labor. Now there are times when you see it now and we praise God for that when we see the fruit of our efforts and we reap that good harvest. But there are times when you won't. And so what are you going to do? Are you going to quit? Are you going to give up? No. No, because we are steadfast. We are unmovable. And we are always abounding in the work of the Lord. Why? Because we know that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. We know that it's not vain. So I can pour myself out for God each and every day, 365 days a year, for the rest of my life, never see any actual outcome, and it's not in vain. If it's done in faith, it's not in vain. But, as God is gracious, very, very often, He will show you, He will give you glimpses of blessing, Glimpses of that reward which is to come. This is important for us to realize because we are so tempted to give up. I want to encourage you. We, we, we spent the, week, the weekend in, uh, in Peace River and a lot of the discussion was about families and marriages. And so I want to encourage you, husbands, listen. Loving your wife as Christ loved the church is never in vain, ever. To love your wife as Christ loved the church, sacrificially, pouring himself out for her, it will never be in vain. What if, what if she doesn't respond in kind? What if she doesn't respond with love? What if she doesn't respond? Be faithful. Your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Continue to serve your king, and you will reap a reward in due time. Wives, submit and honor to your husbands as unto the Lord. What if he doesn't respond? What if he's still contentious and difficult? Be faithful. Your labor is not in vain in the Lord. How do I know that? He says it right here. He has promised, and he cannot lie. And so when you pour out your life in honor of your husband, and you don't see the fruit, he, he doesn't respond. He's not loving as he should. He's not kind like you would want him to be. He's not listening when you're speaking. It's okay. God sees. 
and he knows that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And you will reap a reward in due time. What if, what if I go out and I share my faith with somebody and they laugh at me? What if I go out and I try to share the gospel and they won't listen? What if no one comes to Christ? Be faithful. Because your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You can be certain of that. The Christian doesn't have to live our lives with uncertainty. If you go out and you, play, you share the gospel with somebody and they don't respond, you've planted a seed. You don't know what the master gardener has planned for that seed or when it will grow. It might take years. It might take decades. But you often hear the testimony of people who come to Christ and it had been a long time thinking about that one thing that one person said that one time. They just couldn't get it out of their heads. That seed, it's planted. It will do its work. Be faithful. Your labor is not in vain for the Lord. So I just want to encourage us, whether we are blessed to see the results of our labor or whether we don't, may we be found faithful. Let us be steadfast, unmovable in the truth of God's word abounding in the work of the Lord. Because I can promise you, according to God, it will be all worth it in the end. It will be more than worth it. In fact, for those of you who are coming to our study in Romans chapter 8, the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, I'm going to try to do this from memory, that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. There is coming a day when God is going to reward his children for their labors. And I can promise you, it won't be in vain. So let us be busy about our Father's business. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, again, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word and the exhortations to be steadfast and immovable. Father, we pray that you would forgive us for so much time wasted, wavering, and wandering, and moving about. So much uncertainty in our hearts, Father, as we listened to the lies of the devil. Father, I pray, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to put those days behind us. The days of uncertainty are past, Father. I pray that we would be today grounded firmly upon the rock that is Christ. Lord, I pray that you would open your word to us as we read it, Lord, and I pray that we would have strength to obey it. Lord, may we bring you honor and glory in all that we do. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.